Hello and welcome to Bondcast, a podcast series where we discuss our views on the latest themes and events shaping rates market. I'm Imogen Bakra, Head of UK Rate Strategy, and I'm joined today by our Global Market Specialists, Giles Gale and Kevin Cummins. Okay, Imogen, so we're going to keep you talking by starting off with the UK today. And um, so UK, I mean, really leading the the way higher for global rates this week after the more inflationary, I'm going to say better than expect, but I mean, frankly, depends on your perspective, really. Um, more <laughs> that, uh, I should say, to be more accurate. Um, you know, what's your take on all of that? <laughs> yeah, on that, I've just been starting to write the week and I've deleted better than expected like three times and had to write higher than expected or upside surprise. Uh, it definitely depends on your perspective. Uh, and for me this week, given our views on the front end, it didn't feel better than expected. <laughs> um, I guess I won't go through all the data in detail, but you know, for anyone who's been paying attention to markets this week or even hasn't been paying attention, uh, the headlines are that the wage inflation data came much higher than expected. Um, and then um, CPI, both at the headline and the core came higher than expected. Um, and so it did show, headline CPI did show some moderation from last month, um, but not as much as, as markets or, or we were looking for. And I guess in a, you know, more problematic for the Bank of England was that core remained at the same level. So um, showing really kind of signs of, of stickiness in, in core and, and um, still strong underlying inflationary pressures, I should say. Um, so what that really boils down to, I think, is is most likely another rate hike from the Bank of England. Um, regular readers of our research or listeners to this pod will know that we had thought that they probably peaked at four and a quarter. Um, but I think with uh, you know a kind of double whammy of upside surprise on the labor market and inflation data this week, it's very difficult to see five monetary policy committee members judging against that backdrop that they've really done enough and that they're ready to pause um, on rate hikes. So we officially now have one more rate hike in our forecast to four and a half. Um, but I would caution against markets getting too carried away in terms of what this data means and how much higher bank rate can go. You know, we have just added in that one additional hike. Um, I think that uh, there's, you know, there's going to be a bit of an alleviation in terms of pressure on the Bank of England, given that headline inflation is going to come down quite rapidly over the next few months. We think as those base effects from higher energy costs this time last year kind of make bring the year on year print down. Um, there's also still this pipeline of tightening to come. You know, we've talked about these lagged um, effects of monetary policy, that slow transmission to the real economy. Um, and, you know, the headwinds that that will generate further down the line are now likely to be even greater, given that we think that there's a, a higher peak in the near term. Um, but also, you know, it wasn't that long ago that the Bank of England was warning against rates at five and a quarter and the detrimental impact that that could have on the economy. Well, the market's now pricing in a peak of 5%. That's really not that far from five and a quarter and unlikely to protect the economy that much from what the bank thought might happen if, if rates got up that high. So um, I, I think the message here is let's not get carried away in, in how much higher we think the rates can go. But also on the flip side, let's not get carried away in terms of how quickly they might cut rates as well. You know, there's clearly um, underlying inflationary pressures that, that are persisting. Um, that stickiness in core inflation, I think, will mean that the, the bank isn't going to cut rates um, as early as, as the market is pricing in. Okay, so slightly higher peak, maybe a little bit more damaging, but um, I suppose, well, the, the question then is now how this uh, feeds into your thinking about longer term rates and your guild call and so on and so on. Has that, any of that changed? Well, we've long had this kind of bearish guilt view. We have a target on 10-year guilt of 4.3%. So, you know, to, to the extent that we now see a kind of higher rate environment with a little bit more inflation, I think that this only points in the right direction for guilts, really. I, I guess this week kind of confirmed two things for us. A, well, like I say, when it comes to the kind of inflationary rate backdrop, I think it just... You know, it confirms this idea that we've talked about before on this pod that investors are probably going to want more convincing signs that inflation is coming down decisively before we see a real bid for duration return. 
Um, and in the UK, it feels like we may well be some way off those signs. So inflation is coming down decisively. Um, and then, you know, away from, I guess, the data this week and what that means for bank rate and inflation, we've also had another heavy week of supply. Um, it has been taken down relatively well. You know, there's been pretty strong demand across all the auctions, both from the DMO and from the Bank of England. But again, just as I said last week, that hasn't come without a concession in the market. We've seen significant underperformance of gilts um, on a cross-market basis. We've seen yields higher outright. Um, and obviously some of that is a reaction to, to, to the data and what was happening at the front end. But I do think, you know, this is really indicative of, of the kind of consistency of this heavy supply outlook and the fact that that clearing price for gilts just has to shift lower um, for the market to be able to, to take all this supply down. So um, renewed conviction, I would say, really in our, in our bearish target for, for gilt yields. And just following on on the supply comments there, um, there's a link in next week and some public finances data, new remit and so on. Maybe just briefly you can tell us what you're looking for there. Yeah, I guess we wouldn't normally necessarily talk about the public finance data on the pod. It's not usually particularly market moving, but next week's is important because it's the final print for the year. Um, it will be March's data, so we'll have the full fiscal year in by then. Um, and so that means it will be accompanied by an updated remit. Um, just with kind of slight adjustments to take into account that that last month of data um, and any financing carry forwards for, for the DMA and the Treasury. Um, our sense is that the uh, remit revisions are likely to be quite small, uh, probably in the region of, of less than 5 billion. Um, we think the risk on that is skewed to the upside, um, i.e. we think that it's going to imply uh, more borrowing for this year, I should say. So not the risks on the 5 billion number are skewed to the upside, but the direction of risks for what it means for the remit are skewed to the upside. Uh, so more borrowing um, in this fiscal year rather than less. Um, I think when it comes to the remit, that's probably going to be, um, uh, that's probably just going to be an addition to the bill financing number. So we get 5 billion or that or less than 5 billion um, in bills. If it's actually to the downside and they need to borrow less this year um, by a similar token, I think that they take that off the large portion of the unallocated. Um, so it seems like a bit of one way risk for the curve heading into next week. You know, either it's more short end bill supply or less unallocated, which tend, you know, the market tends to assume as because of, you know, how it has been done over history, um, that that will be ultimately less longs or, or less linkers. So a bit of one way risk for the curve heading into that, but I think that the the number or the revision is, is likely to be very small anyway. What it does mean though, is that the linker probably comes on Wednesday rather than Tuesday as normal. Um, I won't go into too much detail in, on the linker here, but, but I guess just to say that it will be the first sort of test of demand, let's say of a slightly bigger um, duration of that. Um, the DMO have, 9 billion that they want to get done plus some of that unallocated portion um, via three linker syndications this year um, and they won't want uh, to look I suppose like they're being too cautious or too concerned about demand by making that that initial syndication a very small size that said I think they also want to make sure that it goes quite well so I don't think they'll be coming out gangbusters with a, a huge syndication or um, at really tight levels um, they will want to attract demand and, and they will want this to be taken down by the market but but it will represent the kind of first test I suppose of of you know what we continue to see as a, a very heavy supply outlook both on the conventional and on the linker side anyway that's enough on the UK <laughs> uh, let's switch over to the Fed then we've got Kevin uh, uh, chief US economist joining us this week um, so Kevin I've got well let's start with the first question I suppose it, Markets seem very confident, as they are in, in other regions as well, that, that further rate rises are coming in the US. You know, they've got a, another 25 basis point hike price in May for the Fed with near certainty, um, which is obviously at odds with our view that we don't think that they hike anymore. Or in fact, we think that they've reached a peak. What is it that you are focused on that the market's not focused on or vice versa that's giving these kind of two quite opposite views? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think as far as, um, I, like you said, it's, it's, it's near certainty that they'd hike another 25 base points. 
uh, move in May on May 3rd, if the meeting were today, um, and it's just under two weeks from the meeting. So we'll see. I mean, the, there is a fair amount of information that we'll get um, ahead of now and then. I mean, the odds for May hike since the FOMC met on March 22nd have kind of oscillated between 40 to so 90% odds of a hike. So at different points since the last meeting, those odds have moved around a bit. And I guess the two biggest factors were that you had some stability in, in markets in the wake of um, the banking crisis. And then the other uh, thing is the data, you know, have been on the weaker side, but they don't necessarily show an initial fallout where there was this massive collapse. You know, the jobs report was still decent enough, even though the trend has moved lower um, with the unemployment rate still hanging in around three and a half percent or so. So, um, and then of course, last week we had the CPI and it was a touch softer than expected, but I guess not dramatically enough. If you look at like Powell has thrown around the idea of looking at like the six month annualized rate and the year over year changes. And, and those are still in and around 5% or so. So that's still, you know, way above their target of 2%. But I think though, um, you know, whether or not they go one more hike, we'll see. I mean, it, you know, the pricing presumably, um, if it were today that they would go with another 25 base point move. Um, and I think the argument to go in that direction were to be, would be something like, well, they've kind of telegraphed this move for a while, and then they'll probably um, kind of set it up to signal that the hiking cycle is over. And, uh, you know, there there's a lot of uncertainty, but there there's from the perspective of they want to remain on hold for an extended period. Um, so, you know, I, I think it would be uh, kind of have some dovish undertones within the messaging. And, you know, we, we aren't going to get updated dot plot in May, but you know, there is, there are plenty of opportunities for the fed chair to communicate that the cycle is likely over and that, um, they've gotten to a range where they feel that they're sufficiently restrictive on policy. That's a, a term that's been used in the statement, um, as well as a lot of fed speak. Um, so, you know, whether it's in the statement itself, the current conditions, the forward guidance or the Q and a, um, the pals, you know, prepared remarks before Q and A. They'll have plenty of opportunity and scope to kind of, you know, make it like a, a dovish hike if needed. Um, but you know, I, I think with the amount of uncertainty out there, they really allowed themselves enough flexibility. If they don't feel like they need to go again, that they may hold off and pause. And I think you know, from that perspective, um, the risks to the economy potentially outweigh the risks on the inflation side. Now, they're not going to necessarily come at it that way, necessarily make that a, a public statement. But I do think that they have to consider that, that, you know, the the tightening in lending standards that we're seeing is going to exacerbate the growth side. It also has important implications and probably a disinflationary impulse on um, the inflation backdrop. So, you know, there, there's enough of a, a, a live debate. We'll get the employment cost index later this month. We'll get kind of the alphabet soup of data. We'll, we'll have GDP, ECI, the ADP, the ISM. Those are all data that are their officials are going to have in hand that they don't have today. Um, in addition to just pricing immediately up to the meeting. Back at the March 22nd uh, press conference, Powell was asked about a pause um, and whether or not they considered it. And he said it was something that they talked about, um, but that ultimately they decided on a 25 base point hike, which had a very strong consensus. And then we got the minutes, you know, last week, and it did suggest that several officials considered a pause as uh, at the March meeting. So, you know, it, it does seem like in the past when pricing is this high, that the Fed doesn't want to under deliver and, and goes through this. But if the data do start to show some, you know, cracks and and uh, uh, Fed senior loan officer opinion survey, which officials will also have, show <clears throat> much more pervasiveness in tightening the lending standards, it's not to say that what's priced in now and what people's expectations are based on a lot of uncertainty 
um, necessarily is followed through at the meeting. So it, I, I don't think it's as much of a slam dunk as 90% odds would typically suggest it would be. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot of information to kind of button up as we head into that meeting that, um, you know, it, it's most likely the scenario right now, but I, I don't, I wouldn't put the odds of, uh, at that it, currently that the market puts at about 90% or so. Okay. Um, and what about the flip side of that equation then? You know, you talked about this tightening in credit standards, the impact, you know, the outweighing impact that further hikes might have on the economy versus on the infl on inflation. Because the market seems pretty convinced that A, they're going to hike in May, but then B, also they're going to cut pretty quickly after that. How do you view the likelihood of of those cuts, the timing, you know, would you be more in line with the market on that side of things or would you push back against that a bit too? No, I think I'd probably have some, I feel a little bit more sympathetic to the idea that they may have to cut rates sooner than our own forecast had. I mean, there's just so much uncertainty. It probably, you know, from a, a broader perspective, just to be clear, we don't have the Fed cutting rates until the first quarter of next year. But I think in the wake of this credit crunch or inevitable credit crunch that we're seeing in the US here, that the odds are that they cut potentially earlier than that. Um, but there's just a lot of uncertainty because there's no real convincing evidence that we're, we've seen just yet a strong fallout that we'd have to pull that you know timeline ahead significantly. Um, but you know our own forecast has had a recession in it in the back half of this year. Um, and if anything, this suggests that the timing may be, it, 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 it could be a bit more severe recession and the timing could happen a little bit faster than what we assumed for, you know, a second half, uh, downturn, um, the data haven't rolled over yet. You know, jobless claims have started to pick up. We've seen, uh, confidence levels remaining at very low levels. I mean, if you look at, I, I did some work on this recently about, um, boardroom confidence being so depressed, typically you see a pretty big pullback in CapEx. And, you know, if, if access to credit is more restricted, uh, small businesses are going to be, you know, more exposed. Um, and they typically take a lot of the brunt of the job losses that we've seen in earlier downturns that have had some, you know, credit crunch uh, as associated with them. So, I think the downside risk to the economy is is has increased in the in in this case, and um, you know it, it seems reasonable to think that you know the Fed could potentially go earlier um, than what others have signaled, and you know the market is already pricing in as you mentioned cuts this year, and I don't think that's um, a, a crazy idea, and and it's just a matter of you know seeing some more convincing evidence before we get the exact timing right. But um, I, I'd agree with the market's view that. A rate cut this later this year seems like a reasonable approach. Okay, lots to watch out for. It feels like in in the next couple of weeks and and months. Then, Giles, let's switch over to Europe. I guess it was a bit of a quieter week in Europe this week. Not a huge amount of data on the calendar. Um, like you said, it kind of felt like the UK was leading kind of fixed income a, a lot of the time this week. We did have a lot of ECB speak though. We had a lot of speeches, interviews, but also the minutes this week from um, the previous meeting. Have we learned much there about their thinking or how they're approaching, I guess, hikes in, in May and beyond? Yeah, you're right. It was uh, quite a week. And the answer to your question is basically no, not really. The hawk versus dove lines are drawn in very, very familiar places. You've obviously got some pauses. You've got others who you know, I think would like to see rates heading up towards three and three quarters, maybe four percent, maybe even higher. Who knows? Um, seems like there are even you know, some who seriously question the need, uh, you know, perhaps for a recession, just to, to be to be able to have any confidence in getting inflation down. And that's one of the things that really shone through from from the minutes. I mean, you know, I'll just draw out a couple of things from from that. I mean, we had been highlighting that the the staff forecasts, for example, the conditioning assumptions on those seem to imply that actually, in order to have inflation on an acceptable trajectory for the uh, the governing council, that perhaps 3.3%, which was their assumption for three-month arrival, would actually be enough. And that would have been consistent with maybe a pause at three and a quarter. 
maybe three and a half, but in that sort of region. And you know, while we have a lot of sympathy with that, the trouble is that many in the council just don't seem to believe in the sporecasts. And so, you know, there were some who were openly questioning the assumption, for example, of um, you know, 4.6% core inflation on average over 2023 and uh, you know, do, talking about this as a sort of you know, immaculate disinflation, that is a disinflation with very little actual cost in terms of actual uh, output. Um, but, so that goes back to what I was saying about this need perhaps for, for, for a recession. And there was also some discussion of asymmetric pass through from energy into core inflation. So, you know, just this idea that you know, when energy is going up, people reset their prices accordingly, but then energy comes back down and they continue because they've discovered they've got high power and so on and so on. Anyway, um, you know, other, other stuff, there was lots on strengthening wages. And then you know, I just drew out one other thing from the speeches this week. Um, Isabel Schnabel put out a nice chart pack and it, it's I, I i i quite appreciate the fact that um you know we now sometimes get speeches that don't actually have a long text they just have a whole lot of pictures <laughs> now they're just looking through her slides it was very it was very clear although there was no text that the hawkish view sort of shone through there was you know stuff on the slow retreat of the fiscal stance in europe there was lots on strong inflation momentum there was stuff on strong wage gains, at least in terms of new deals and so on. Um, also quite a lot on the better financial condition via markets. So, you know, mm -hmm. we will see, of course, in a couple of weeks time, what's happening in M3. So credit creation, what's happening in the bank lending survey. Uh, those will all just be just before the ECB's um, next meeting. But um, you know, the fact remains that actually, as far as you know, what markets are providing, particularly in their equity markets, Credit no, is not um, especially tight and certainly not more than it was at the last meeting. Okay. How do you put all that together then in, in your market views? You know, we talked a lot last week about, well, I don't want to remind people that I just said the same thing, that markets are pricing in too much from the Bank of England, but we also talked about them pricing in too much for the ECB and, and um, you know, trade uh, and the market themes that you liked off the back of that. How how does that leave you this week? I suppose not just when it comes to ECB, but also, you know, with regard to country spreads and outright duration and things like that. Yeah, I mean, again, it's not going to surprise anyone after a reasonably quiet week. We had a bit of a sell off, but I mean, the the fundamentals that you know, from our perspective haven't really changed, and so our our key themes also haven't changed. So just to remind people, uh, you know, we're talking about fading this cheapest of all downturn. So we do think that um, that the pricing for these has overshot a little bit on the high side. Uh, we think that at the same time, you know, what we ought to be looking for is a sort of a highish, but a longish plateau for, for rates. So that means fading the front end inversion. So money market curve disinversion talked about that last week as well of course and that really we think should propagate out the curve so steepeners along the curve but it's really in that money market sector that we think you have the best risk reward we're also still bearish as we have been for months uh, again that's a little bit subordinate to the steepening view at the moment so, no, that's where we think the risk reward is and then on country spreads and asset swap spreads as well you know we are looking for tightening really uh, across everything. Great, nice and concise. <laughs> okay, let's wrap it up there then this week. Lots to be thinking about um, in the weeks ahead, but we will of course catch up on that uh, at the same time next week. So thank you both for joining me and thank you to our listeners. Just a reminder, if you liked today's episode, please don't forget to hit the like button and click subscribe so you can get the latest episodes as soon as they're available. Thanks, see you next week.